Good morning, everyone. I trust and pray that you are safe and healthy. It's strange to be preaching to a screen rather than all of you, I'll be honest. Let's pray we get to gather soon in safety and health. Many are asking, where is God in all this? Or why would God allow this? Or even God must be punishing us with this virus. We must be careful with some of these questions and statements. Yes, of course, God invites us to reason with him, as Isaiah encourages us. God desires for all of us to bring the tough questions and even wrestle some things out with him. But we tread on dangerous ground with statements like God must be punishing so-and-so. God is so angry and fed up with such-and-such trying to pridefully and naively attribute blame for natural disasters, pandemics, acts of God, as it were, is not for his people to do. In fact, God admonishes Job for doing this very thing, and God gets angry. First of all, as God's masterpieces, his created works, who are we to try and assess and understand the mind of the Creator? You know, it would be like the statue David interrogating Michelangelo. You know, why are you putting my hand like this? Why are you chiseling off that marble there? I don't know if I want my toes facing this direction. I could imagine Michelangelo's response, much like God's. Quiet! Just trust me and let me work. Hush! I know what I'm doing. It's not for you to concern yourself with such things. When I was in seminary, the very first page of my systematic theology textbook by Millard Erickson said this, For humans to attempt to describe the things of God would be like staring into the sun and trying to describe what you see. You can't. It's too dazzling and blinding. And, in fact, if you stare too long, you could do some permanent damage. It's a fantastic illustration, but it's also a good warning. I pray no human ever gets to the point where he or she claims to fully understand God's mind. It would be dangerous, and it would actually undermine God's plan for humanity on earth. What do I mean? I'll explain. Track with me, please. When you read Genesis 1, as God creates the heavens and the earth, he repeatedly and rhythmically says, Let there be. Let there be light. Let there be a vault to separate water from water. Let there be water gathered in one place. Let there be land and vegetation and so on. N.T. Wright calls this a lavishing let there be. God is creating and commissioning. If you look up the phrase, let there be, in the Hebrew, it means several things at once. Of course it means to come into existence, but at the same time it also means to endure, to repeat, to remain existing. There's even an element of adaptation. Take a moment and think about the implications. In creating the universe, God created the planets, the stars, and their movements, their orbits. God created and imparted the cycle of life and death of these celestial entities. The universe is constantly moving, adapting, divinely dancing, so to speak. And now think of the earth and all of its systems. God created the oceans and their currents, the land and all of its ecosystems, the sky and the movement of air streams and moisture, and even bacterial and viral systems, which, if the earth is stewarded as God intended, are actually healthy for environments and vegetation. God created all of this, blessed it, and commissioned all of it to exist, to adapt, and to continue to move, and even to dance. So, when God created human beings, 
the crown of his created efforts, the lords and ladies of the dance, as it were. His declaration, it was very good, was a blessing, commissioning, and a release. We've looked at the words dominion, rule, and subdue before, but taken all together, God is saying to humanity, look, I created everything with momentum, energy, and movement. I created the earth and all of its systems, seen and unseen, for you, my children, to rule, to subdue, to harness with wisdom and humility, rule over it all, care for all of it, benefit from all these things, and then share the blessing with your fellow humankind. So here's my question. Have we succeeded in doing this? Have we, as human beings, worked together to shepherd, steward, and humbly harness the earth and all of its extensive systems? Sadly, I think not. As with every decision we make, there are physical and spiritual implications. When we fulfill the creative mandate God intended, there is blessing both physical and spiritual. But we allowed sin into the world, which has had a negative effect, both physical and spiritual. So is God distant? Has God removed himself? Has he abandoned us? No, I would hope we would agree no, absolutely not. God is sovereign, and that's eternal. Amen. Is God responsible for COVID-19 coronavirus? Again, no, absolutely not. Remember, God created everything to exist, adapt, and endure. He created and commissioned us to rule and harness all these systems in humility and grace. He created us human beings to exist, to learn, to adapt, to endure if we cling to our commissioning as God's people. So God created these forces and systems and processes, and we are responsible for their impact as his rulers, good and bad. When there is negative impact, God wants us to learn and try again and succeed and then share the blessing. But if we continue to mess up, if we continue to unwisely go our own way, when we lose sight of his commissioning and focus on us and neglect concern for others, we can expect God to intercede in his own way. Pastor Tony Evans says that God is always speaking. But when we get too distracted, too focused on the wrong things, too selfish, too greedy, too prideful, God can and will shake us at times to get our attention. He will use some of the forces and systems he's created to get our attention. He will shake the earth at times in order to wake us up. So just think about this. In the last decade, with the progression of technology and social media, the internet, Yes, we are more quote-unquote connected to what we think is important, right? But if we step back, never has humanity been so disconnected from each other. We've been robbed of community. We've been robbed of common dignity, social graces, etiquette, manners, cultural respect, decorum, and respectable customs. We've lost chivalry and have become selfish, divided, segregated, and aggressively reactive. We've succeeded in pushing God out of practically every sphere of living, and we've even closed all the doors. In Matthew 22, Jesus gives us an extremely important love equation. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. What's the equation? Well, very simply, love God, love others as you love yourself. So, 
we need all three elements to successfully, truly love as God's people. In order to carry the mantle of stewardship and dominion as God's earthly rulers, we are to one, love God first, two, love others, and three, love ourselves, meaning if we push God out and tell him, no God, I got this, your way is old, stale, and irrelevant, well, then we can't truly love others. And we are unable to love and care for ourselves. Who knows us better than our Creator? Or we may think we love God, but others annoy us. I don't and can't agree with others. They voted for so-and-so. They believe such-and-such, and, such, and there's no reason to learn anything from them. Well, our equation tells us that when we do that, we cannot fully love God or ourselves if we are not actively and intentionally loving others. And finally, how many of us truly love ourselves? Do we even like or can we even put up with ourselves? I'm so ugly, I'm so fat, I'm stupid, I can't stand myself. Well, then how can we really love others if we can't love and care for ourselves? And ultimately, how can we even begin to love God, who is above time and space, yet ever-present in us and in his creation? Well, we can't. Listen to what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 4. Be free from pride-filled opinions, for they will only harm your cherished unity. Don't allow self-promotion to hide in your heart's but in authentic humility, put others first and view others as more important than yourselves. Abandon every display of selfishness. Possess a greater concern for what matters to others instead of your own interests. Paul is elaborating on Jesus' simple command to love God and love others as ourselves. At first glance, we may think that Paul is removing us from the equation, but that's not what he's saying at all. As we are loving others, we are simply putting them before us. Paul absolutely says we are to be concerned for ourselves, but we are to show greater concern for others. You see what he's saying? This is the foundation, the core, the essence of the commissioned Christ follower. If we are carrying the mantle of God's rulership and lordship in the world, we are always loving God and loving others as we love ourselves. And we're doing this in community and fellowship, domestic and abroad. Isn't it interesting that no matter what anyone believes, we are all, every single human being right now, forced to care for others and ourselves. With the rapidity of potential transmission, we are now faced with first thinking about others by caring for ourselves, hygiene, social distancing, hand washing, etc. Isn't it interesting that with all the divisiveness and discord, we are now united in survival and concern for each other, no matter what any of us believes or doesn't believe? I pray that this is an opportunity for families, households, communities to recultivate unity, grace, dignity, and love for each other. Has God got everyone's attention? Are we created humanity ready and willing to dust off that mantle of humble rulership and lordship over all creation? Are we willing to restore our earthly role as God's humble, loving shepherd stewards? Oh, I pray we are, friends. For what else does God need to shake for us to remember who he is and whose we are? As we consider these things, let us rest in the assurance of our God's sovereignty and omnipotence, and remain steadfast in our assurance in Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. I'm excited about the new series we're launching today, Against All Odds. 
What are the odds that Jesus is actually who he says he is? What are the odds that one person could fulfill all the prophecy in the Old Testament? What are the odds that God could actually raise Jesus from the dead? Those are some of the questions we'll be exploring in this Easter series. How many of us have ever rolled through a stop sign? I'll admit that I have. How many of us have ever driven over the speed limit? Guilty again, friends. I won't ask, however, how many of us have ever texted while driving or used a non-hands-free phone to make a call from our car while moving. The point is, what if we had to pay a $200 fine every time we broke a traffic law? Well, we'd be incapable of paying the price, right? I, at least for me, the price would be far too high, wouldn't it? Well, the Bible says that every time we cross a moral line, there is a price that has to be paid. Every time we cheat on a test, every time we massage the truth, every time we take something, anything that isn't ours, every time we say something that hurts someone else, Every time we cross any kind of sexual boundary, every time we just fill in the blank. God knew that we could never ever pay the price for all these mess-ups. So what did he do? He sent his son to pay the price for us once and for all. But there are still consequences for the sin we cause. When we sin, that continues to separate us from God, and if we don't repent when we sin, we will end up living separated from God, forever. But friends, God doesn't want this to happen. God so loved the world that he didn't want anyone to be separated from him, so he sent his son Jesus to pay for our sin. Hallelujah. What Jesus did was historic, supernatural, and sacrificial. I'm calling this series Against All Odds because what Jesus did for all of us really was against all odds, even though it was predicted. Follow me for just a moment. Hundreds of years before Jesus came to earth, God sent a series of prophets to tell us what Jesus would do. One of those prophets was named Isaiah. Isaiah lived 700 years before Jesus. He wrote one of the longest books in the Bible, and he lived one of the longest lives of any prophet. His active ministry lasted over 60 years. Isaiah wrote a powerful chapter of Scripture. This chapter, written seven centuries before Jesus walked the earth, is so incredibly detailed and accurate that it continues to baffle, even intimidate, many people. And here's the scripture we'll be exploring. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13, through chapter 53, verse 12. Here's what we read. See, my servant will be successful. He will be raised and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were appalled at you, his appearance was so disfigured that he did not look like a man, and his form did not resemble a human being. So he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths because of him, for they will see what had not been told them, and they will understand what they had not heard. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised, and we didn't value him. Yet he himself bore our sicknesses, and he carried our pains. But we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds." 
We all went astray like sheep, we all have turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment, and who considered his fate? For he was cut off from the land of the living, he was struck because of my people's rebellion. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, but he was with a rich man at his death, because he had done no violence, had not spoken deceitfully. Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. When you make him a guilt offering, he will see his seed, he will prolong his days, and by his hand the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. After his anguish, he will see the light and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will carry their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him the many as a portion, and he will receive the mighty as spoil, because he's willingly submitted to death. And he was counted among the rebels, yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. Years ago, Dr. Peter Stoner did a study in mathematical probabilities. He knew from studying the Bible that Jesus Christ fulfilled over 300 prophecies of Scripture while he was on earth. Stoner, who was a mathematician by trade, set out to calculate the probability that any one person could fulfill that many prophecies predicted centuries before. So what is the probability that one man could actually fulfill over 300 biblical predictions? It turns out that we'll never know. When Dr. Stoner got to the probability that anyone could fulfill just eight scriptural predictions, the number was so large he had to use an equation for it. Stoner's number for one person fulfilling eight scriptural prophecies was 1 times 10 to the 17th power. That's a one with 17 zeros behind it. In English, in America, we call that number 100 quadrillion. Dr. Stoner said to appreciate how large this number is, imagine filling the state of Texas two feet deep in silver dollars. Then mark one silver dollar with a red X and mix them all up blindfold someone, spin them around, and have them pick that silver dollar on the very first try. Wow. That's the probability that any one person could fulfill just eight prophecies. Stoner continued on with nine, ten, eleven, twelve prophecies. When he reached the probability of forty-eight prophecies, he actually had to stop. Why? Because the number he had calculated was 1 times 10 to the 157th power. That's a 1 followed by 157 zeros. To put this into perspective, the total number of atoms in the known universe is estimated to be 10 to the 82nd power, a 1 followed by 82 zeros and there's actually a number for that. That's 100,000 quadrillion vigintillion atoms. Yikes. So 700 years before Jesus of Nazareth came to earth, the prophet Isaiah, in the scripture we read today, recorded 24 predictions about Jesus. What are the odds? Well, let's look at them. Isaiah 52, 13 says, See, my servant will be successful. He will be raised and lifted up and greatly exalted. Listen to Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 to 18. John paints for us a picture of the resurrected Jesus in heaven. He says, When I saw Jesus, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. One commentator says Jesus has been exalted by his Father by raising him from the dead, giving him glory by placing him at his own right hand, and giving him all power in heaven and in earth, 
by committing all judgment into his hands, that all may honor him as they do the Father. And he is extolled by his people in his person and offices by giving him the glory of their salvation in their hearts, thoughts, and affections with their mouths and lips. And so he is in his house and ordinances by his ministers and churches and is made very high, higher than the kings of the earth, higher than the angels of heaven, higher than the heavens themselves. Jesus was successful. Amen. He was raised and lifted up and greatly exalted. Jesus is the fulfillment of this prophecy. The next verse says, Just as many were appalled at you, his appearance was so disfigured that he did not look like a man, and his form did not resemble a human being. Why was everyone appalled? Well, because Jesus was beaten so horribly that he was unrecognizable. The Romans flogged Jesus with a flagrum. It was a handle with two to three foot leather straps, and each strap was weighted with shards of lead and fragments of bone. The point was not to leave welts, friends, but to lacerate and tear. In the 4th century AD, church historian Eusebius describes the horror of a flogging with a flagrum, and he writes, the bystanders were struck with amazement when they saw them lacerated with scourges, even to their innermost veins and arteries, so that the hidden inward parts of the body, both their bowels and their members, were exposed to view. Utterly horrifying, yes? And our Savior fulfills this prophecy. The final verse of chapter 52 says, So he will sprinkle many nations, Kings will shut their mouths because of him, for they will see what had not been told them, and they will understand what they had not heard. The sprinkling of nations refers to foreign nations receiving the good news. Messengers of Jesus have sprinkled the good news in every nation of the world. And often when a king like Agrippa in Acts 26 or Clovis of the Frankish kingdom in 500 AD heard the good news, well, they just simply shut their mouths, many times in confusion or even awe. And then after listening and understanding, kings like Clovis and many others led their kingdoms to convert to Christianity. Jesus' blood and the good news of his resurrection was sprinkled across the nations into the very hearts of new believers, just as Isaiah prophesied. The next prophecy is Isaiah 53, verse 2. He grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He didn't have an impressive form or majesty that we should look at him, no appearance that we should desire him. Until the birth of Jesus, no one believed that when the Messiah appeared, he would come as a baby. Nevertheless, Jesus the Messiah did in fact grow up, and yet again Jesus fulfills another prophecy. So far we've covered five verses and four prophecies, and the last ten verses have twenty. Verse three, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering who knew what sickness was. He was like someone people turned away from. He was despised and we didn't value him. The Sanhedrin rejected Jesus during three trials that took place during the night of Good Friday. And the people rejected him when Pilate asked if he should release Jesus or Barabbas as a gesture of goodwill for the Passover holiday. The crowd chose Barabbas, we all know this, and for Jesus they shouted, Crucify him. Next verse, yet he himself bore our sickness and he carried our pains. Well, this was true from his very first days of ministry. Everywhere Jesus went, he bore people's sicknesses by healing them. And he carried their pains by walking with and counseling them. Moving on, but we in turn regarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. On the Day of Atonement, a special goat called the scapegoat was brought into the temple and stricken with the sins of the people. A red sash was tied around its forehead symbolizing all these sins, and this scapegoat, called Azazel, 
was then led away into the wilderness by the high priest as a way of illustrating that the people's sins had been taken away. Interesting, in John 19, verse 15, when Pilate asked if he should release Jesus, the crowd shouted, Take him away. And the word for take him away in Hebrew is Azazel. He was stricken. Next verse, But he was pierced because of our rebellion, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him, and we are healed by his wounds. Jesus was crucified between two criminals on the afternoon before Passover. Normally it took two or three days for a victim to die by crucifixion, but during Passover, with so many coming to Jerusalem, the Jewish people didn't want anyone, even those crucified, suffering in pain during the holiday. So, just before sundown, as Passover began, the Roman guards brutally broke the legs of the two criminals on either side of Jesus so that they would suffocate and die faster. But when they came to Jesus, he had already passed. He was already dead, having died of a broken heart when God laid the sins of the world upon him. So instead of breaking his legs, they used a spear and pierced his pericardium to verify that he was actually dead. Prophecy fulfilled. Next verse, we all went astray like sheep. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of all of us. Jesus was punished for our sins. The exact moment he was punished is recorded in Mark 15, verse 34, where Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus' punishment was the reality of separation from God the Father. This was the punishment, the consequence of sin Jesus suffered for our sake. Another prophecy fulfilled. Next verse, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Matthew tells us that during Jesus' trial, he never defended himself or confronted his accusers. He remained silent. Next verse, like a lamb led to the slaughter, like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. The lambs that were raised in Bethlehem for slaughter in the temple were led up the Kidron Valley the day before Passover. Jesus was led up that same path to his death, prophecy fulfilled. He was taken away because of oppression and judgment, and who considered his fate? After Jesus' sixth trial, he was taken away to be crucified. The crowd even shouted to Zazel, Take him away! For he was cut off from the land of the living, he was struck because of my people's rebellion. Ephesians 4 records that following his death, Jesus descended into hell to a place called Abraham's bosom, where he freed all the Old Testament saints who were waiting there to be led to heaven once Messiah had paid for their sins. So Jesus was cut off from the land of the living there on Holy Saturday before rising again on Easter Sunday. Prophecy fulfilled. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, but he was with a rich man at his death because he had done no violence and had not spoken deceitfully. Crucified criminals were normally thrown into a mass grave outside the walls of Jerusalem. But a rich man, we read, named Joseph of Arimathea, volunteered his own tomb for Jesus' burial. Yet the Lord was pleased to crush him severely. Well, because by crushing Jesus with the weight of our sins, we were finally set free as God's people. Moving on, when you make him a guilt offering, the only animals that were qualified to be sacrificed in guilt offerings were animals that had no spots, no blemishes. Jesus lived a spotless, blameless, blemish-free, sinless life so that he would be qualified to become a guilt offering on our behalf. He will see his seed, he will prolong his days, and by his hand the Lord's pleasure will be accomplished. Well, Jesus saw his seed, the children of Abraham, when he descended to Abraham's bosom. And he prolonged his days by appearing to many for forty days after his resurrection. Moving on, after his anguish, he will see light and be satisfied. 
on Easter Sunday morning, Jesus saw the light by being raised from the dead. Hallelujah. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will carry their iniquities. Romans chapter 5 verse 9 says that we are justified by his blood. Next in verse 12, therefore I will give him the many as a portion, and he will receive the mighty as spoil. In Revelation 7, Jesus is surrounded by a countless multitude from every people, tribe, nation, language. Next phrase, because he willingly submitted to death. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed, If it is possible, Father, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, by thy will be done. The next phrase, and was counted among the rebels. While well, Pilate counted Jesus with Barabbas and the others who were rebelling against the Roman Empire. Of course, we know he wasn't rebelling, but... Pilate counted Jesus among the rebels. And the last phrase says, Yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. On the cross, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, and answered the prayer of the thief on the cross next to him when he asked Jesus to remember him when he came into his kingdom. Romans 8 says he is interceding for all of us rebels right now at the throne of God. And so, friends, in all these ways, Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy. In fact, Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all scriptural prophecy. Amen? Jesus' death was historic. Jesus' death was supernatural. Jesus' death was sacrificial. And Jesus' death was predicted and predicted and predicted. So, what are the odds? Do you believe was this just an accident by chance? Well, if you covered the United States, no, the planet Earth two feet deep in silver dollars, you know, that still wouldn't come anywhere near the odds. So will you, friends, journey with me this Easter against all odds? Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming for living, suffering, dying. Thank you for bearing our punishment. And we praise you for rising for our salvation. Would you embolden us to be used by you to sprinkle the nations with your good news so that everyone might hear of it and respond to and receive your love. Open the world's hearts to your invitation. Instill in everyone a desire to experience the gift you offer everyone the gift of forgiveness, salvation, and a relationship with you forever and ever. Your name is Jesus, and we worship you as the exalted one, who is like no other. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that in you the odds are in our favor. And everyone said, Amen. God bless all of you.